Hello everyone. Today let's talk about Wolfram Alpha. Never heard of it? Well then let me introduce you. This is Stephen Wolfram. He is the creator of Wolfram Alpha. It is an answer engine developed by Wolfram Research. It answers factual queries by computing answers from externally sourced data. This site is a freemium site, but it has both free and subscription versions. I've never needed anything but the freebie version, but the choice is yours. I was introduced to the site by one of my absolutely favorite Roots Tech speakers, Thomas McKinty. This is the homepage of Wolfram Alpha. There are four major categories and many subcategories under each one. Be forewarned, you can lose major time just looking through the site. It is fascinating and you will find answers to questions you didn't even know you had. My advice to you, set a timer or your time will just disappear. For family history, the two categories that I have used the most so far are history and words and linguistics. However, I'm sure that you could find family history in many of the other categories too. One thing to remember, this site is very English-centric and very US-centric. Ever had a problem figuring out relationships? Just plug it into Wolfram Alpha and it will do the work for you. In this example, I wanted to know what the relationship would be between my father's mother's brother's daughter. Here is the answer. Many of us would know this off of the top of our head, but for others it would be a little harder, so this could be helpful. Notice how it is worded in that top box. Look at the second arrow for the input interpretation. You always want to look at the input interpretation to make sure that the interpretation is what you want. If it isn't, you will have options next to that to change the interpretation. We'll see that in some of the other examples. Looking down this slide, you see the tree and other relationship properties. Also notice that you can change with a button to see more or less information. That too is available on most every result. I wanted to know about the name Henry. In this example, I put in Henry and then name in the top. And then I check the assumption. Now look at this. I'm assuming that Henry is the given name. You could also check use as a surname instead or use Henry as a person. I'm also assuming that Henry is a male. If I wanted to use Henry as a female, I would check that instead. Note that Henry is ranked as the ninth most popular name in the U.S. On the graph, notice that Henry was a very popular name in 1880 and going through the 1800s and through it started declining and it looked like it hit its low point in 1980-1990, but as you can see, it's made a resurgence over the years. This is the bottom half of the page under Henry. This is really important because sometimes we want to know what the alternate versions of the name might be, so we can use those in our searches. Some of these versions of Henry I've never heard, but it could be a clue if I couldn't find a relative named Henry or something that would guide me back to the name I really needed. So Hal, Hank, Harry, has, has a, hen, hence, hi, and Shanka. I have no idea where Shanka came from. You have notable people named Henry in history here, and also the etymology from a Germanic name Heimrich, which means home ruler. And this is on the bottom of these pages, so it will give you ideas of other ways to search for people in your family. Also, you can look for surnames. In this example, I just put in Smith and surname after that. I checked to make sure that the input interpretation was right. And notice that Smith is the number one ranked surname in the United States. Listed are some notable people with the same surname and also the ethnic fractions for the name Smith in the United States. Here's the bottom page of that surname for Smith. There's sources, which is always fun to read where the sources, where they got their information. And here's a pie chart of the ethnic fractions. 
Have you ever had the problem that you are reading a record and you can read some of the letters but not all of them? In this example, perhaps in your record you can see the first letter looks like a B and the last letter looks like a P. But maybe you've got three letters in there that you can't figure out. So what you would do in this example, you would type in the B because you know for sure in your written record that the first letter is a B, the last letter is a P, but there's three letters in between that you can't figure out. So you would type the B and type an underscore for the three letters you can't figure out in a P. I have three that could possibly help me with a genealogically related record given in the context. So this comes up with 21 words that could possibly have a B and a P at the end and three letters. So my ancestor could have been number one, a bar hop. Maybe he was number two, a bishop, or possibly my ancestor was number three, buried in a burlap sack. All jokes aside, I think you can see how this could be helpful in your efforts. Remember using sound decks in the good old days? or not so good old days. We needed to figure out that little sound X code. Many of us can still do that since we had to do it manually for so long. However, here's another way. Type in sound X and then the name that you need to have the sound X code. For Williams, the sound X code is W452. Here's a way to find similar sounding English words. Try this out. I found that it works better on some names than other names, but you may just find what you're looking for. In this example, I put in sounds like Peter. The input interpretation is a sound X lookup for Peter and similar sounding words, Padre, Pedro, Pedro, and Peter. Also, you can take a look at the more on the right hand side, or you can look at related queries, words made with the letters in Peter, CAPTCHA Peter, permutations and anagrams. So if you're a real geek, you can try out all those things and have a great time. Sometimes you need to know a date, but you only know an event. In this example, I want to know the date of New Year's Day in 1862. Double check your assumption and see your result. For this New Year's Day in 1863, was January 1862, was Wednesday, January 18, first 1862. Uh-oh, it looks like I goofed that one. Also notice you can click on the more button and see what other countries view as their New Year's Day. Scroll down with for even more information. So if you look on the right hand side under more, you can see you've got what is called it Islam, you've got the Chinese New Year, New Year's Day, the Rastafarian, the one in Vietnam, and there's more under that. So it looks like I just kind of messed that one up a little bit. New Year's Day, I guess I called it, I put the wrong thing in my notes. So you have date formats, then you have a time difference from today. I was doing this yesterday. We have a number of years and you have, this was 8,000, 392 weeks ago, 58,744 days ago. The time in 1864, it was, or 1862 is the first day, the first week. And you have a few anniversaries that are on January 1st, 1862. Like I said, you can get lost just looking at all the minutia of everything, but it's kind of fun. Here's the bottom of that page, the Wikipedia summary. New Year's Day is a festival observed in most of the world on January 1st, the first day of the year in the modern Gregorian calendar. The 1st of January is also New Year's Day on the Julian calendar, but this is not the same day as the Gregorian one. Okay, so that'll give you a clue if you are working in countries that use the Julian calendar and then switch to Gregorian calendar, you may want to check that out. Okay, how many of us have run into a tombstone that says this? December 22nd, 1840, 42 years, one month, and four days. We all love that the death date is stated, but what about the birth date? Throw this information into Wolfram Alpha for your answer. Make sure you write it out with a space between the death year and a space before each hyphen. So in this example, the death date was December 22nd, 1840. 
and they died when they were 42 years, one month, and four days. You check the input interpretation, and the result is the birth date was November 18th, 1798. And you'll look at the different formats, you'll get a time difference, and look at all sorts of things on this. Like I said, it's really fun to look at. Do you love newspapers? I sure do, except when the obituary says, Mrs. Brown passed away last Wednesday. In my experience, my small town newspapers tended to do this a lot. To calculate the date, you will want to use the newspaper publication date. Here's what I needed to use to get an ancestor's death date. Wednesday before January 22nd, 1841. I checked my assumption and the interpretation. I found that Wednesday before January 22nd, 1841, was Wednesday, January 20th, 1841. And that was what I needed to know for the death date. A couple of other things that are fun. Have you ever needed to know about historical money value? My aunt bought her brownstone in Brooklyn as a newly married bride in 1941. They paid $4,200 for it. If they had to pay for it in today's dollars, it would have cost them $76,000, $76,781.99. In reality, given the hyper crazy prices in Brooklyn, New York these days, that brownstone just sold for $700,000, which was a bargain because it was in need of desperate repair. Now, let's say that in 1941, my aunt married a Rockefeller and they bought the brownstone as an investment for $700,000 in 1941 dollars. What would that be worth in today's dollars? That little 1,200 square foot two-story brownstone that I remember would be worth 12.8 million in 2022 dollars. One last example for today. Another piece of information you can look up is the weather. The information can be spotty though. I tried different dates and places, but found most of the information for my family and areas wasn't readily available until the early 1970s. I wanted to know what the weather in Pennsylvania was like in the year 1973. As you can see, they had an average year. I really wanted to know about 1972 because there was a huge flood in June and July of 1972 in Pennsylvania where my grandparents lived but 1972 wasn't available. The flooding was caused by Hurricane Agnes. Again, it will depend on your individual time frame and areas. Notice that you can also change the information to the metric system. So that wraps up our whirlwind tour through a tiny piece of Wolfram Alpha. Please take the time to check it out for yourself. Just remember, set a timer. And as always, please visit the BYU Family History Library for more about one-on-one -on -one help, both virtual and in-person, classes and library resources. And be sure to subscribe to our BYU Family History YouTube channel for more short family history and in-depth webinars. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.